Thank you for joining our second webinar in our four-part Open NFP Fall Webinar Series. Today, Ashkan Agdai is going to present design and implementation of the hybrid modular switch. A copy of the presentation, archived replay, as well as any project code will be made available shortly after the webinar. These, as well as our previous webinars, can all be found on the classroom page of the OpenNFP.org website. OpenNFP's objective is to support and grow reusable applied research and technology development and data plane network functions processing. We do this by focusing on reducing the barriers to performing research in the space to researchers and developers creating, implementing, and verifying their ideas on prod production networking hardware. OpenNFP supports research in a wide range of technologies, including software-defined networking, OpenFlow, OpenVSwitch, and P4. We support researchers with a variety of tools, including deeply discounted hardware, IDE software, and cloud access to development systems and direct support from our engineers and our research community. We also provide support to learn advanced networking concepts on our hardware through tutorials and seminars, such as the one we are performing today. We encourage proposals to research funding agencies. Ashkan Agdai is a PhD candidate in electrical engineering at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. His research is mostly focused on improving the performance of distributed applications in data centers using cutting edge technologies such as network functions, virtualization, and software defined networking. Ashkan received his Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering from Sheriff University of Technology in Tehran, Iran in June 2012 and started working in NYU Tandon's high-speed networking lab under supervision of Professors H. Jonathan Chow and Yang Xu in September 2012. Hybrid Modular Switch is a P4 compatible switch that uses Metronome SmartNICs, PCI Express, and processor to function as line cards, switch fabric, and a fabric controller, respectively. We invite you to join the 50 plus universities and companies working directly with the Open NFP through projects. Please stay tuned after the webinar for a special Open NFP announcement. Thank you, and over to you, Ashkan. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you all for attending this webinar. So uh, this is a joint work in NYU School of Engineering with me and my advisors, uh, Yang Xu and H. Jonathan Chow. So the essence of this project is a very cheap way to build a uh, scalable P4 switch using commodity hardware. When I say cheap, I mean both in terms of how much effort you put into developing NFE applications and obviously the cost. So our main focus is implementing uh, novel uh, network function virtualization applications. So the, this is how, where the industry is headed to. Usually when they want to implement such functions at ISPs, at AT&T or wherever, uh, they usually rely on servers to offload complex network functions. So they would have a programmable switch uh, be it OpenFlow or P4, and usually uh, more simpler functions are programmed using the switch at L2 and L3, and servers are used for offloading uh, transport layer functions. Um, so this is kind of the industry standard, but there are a couple of problems with this uh, unique design. Uh, the first problem is that using this architecture, we cannot influence uh, scheduling. Basically, if you want to implement something like pretty simple, like VLAN priority classes, or if you want to uh, guarantee SLAs, it's not a suitable architecture for that. And also, relying uh, for, for highly state, stateful packet processing, something we usually try to avoid in data plane, but sometimes you have to do it anyways. If the state is too large, this architecture is again not suitable because the switch cannot hold very large state. So in more detail, this is how switches look like currently. So usually we have 
a micro server, server embedded in the series. This is usually used for uh, implementing control plane functions, making it compatible with legacy networks, or even you can offload, use, use this micro server to offload very simple functions. So again, the, the focus is that we want programmable scheduling as one of the very basic functions, and this architecture doesn't provide it. They're basically the architecture of Wi-Fi switches, be it Facebook Wedge or uh, what barefoot is, uh, with, with, with a barefoot chip or with a uh, normal platform chip. So to sum up, uh, there are two ways to go about implementing an FE application. Either we go full software, something like NetVM, which relies on DPDK and it's fully implemented on software commodity, uh, using software on commodity servers. Um, the bandwidth, the, the maximum throughput you can get from something like this is low. I, I was kind of generous, order of 100 gigabit per second. The, the, the main problem is that the delay is undeterministic. It uh, depends on your applications. And with the way the industry is, doing these things is usually through a P4 with offload servers and they can get much higher throughput. But um, with less flexibility in terms of programmability and less modularity, although this is a white box solution, you can still not customize it very much. It's like the way we like to do that in academia, it's not possible. So, what we do to, to, in this project, we go about designing, uh, coming up with a compromise between these two. We want programmability in both of these two. We want P4 as well as DPDK. We'd rather use a commodity server instead of AC. And even for throughput, we are happy if we get something higher than NetVM, but if we cannot match that, the throughput of a white box suite. So, with that in mind, and the main goal is designing and accelerating NFE applications. With that in mind, let's design a programmable switch. So we, we have a couple of ingredients for, for uh, packet forward. The first, obviously, the first and foremost, we need to process packets. We need programmable table lookups. We need match action tables, whatever P4 does for you. So this can be implemented as line cards in this video. So line cards that take care of processing of the packets. And then obviously we need to be able to switch the packets between the line cards to really implement a packet forward. So the second part is uh, we need a fabric, something to copy the packets from ingress port to an ingress port. And finally, we need to do that efficiently. Like we may have, um, input port contentions, uh, uh, head of the line blocking, stuff like that. So we need a packet a scheduler to uh, do the switching efficiently. These are basically the three basic functions of a programmable switch. Programmability comes at this side. If, if these packet processors are programmable, then the whole switch is. And the programmability at a scheduling is come coming from the fabric controller. If this part is programmable, then we have a programmable schedule. So with that, let's go and uh, see these ingredients one by one in our uh, implementation. So for the line cards, we use a smart mix, uh, basic or natural mix. So I think all of you are familiar with this design. This is basically as if you have a very small switch in your line card. It has some physical ports that gives you uh, 10 to 100 GE Ethernet on this side, and you can instantiate uh, virtual interfaces to send packets to the processor and uh, uh, whatnot. So in terms of this side, uh, we have, we can, I think, uh, instantiate 32, 64, or 128 SRIOV interface, depending on the card you have. And the whole switch over here is programmable through P4 or C, or a combination of both. So in terms of programmability, we can get something, a superset of P4. Argument P4 with uh, C, 
uh, micro C functions here. So these are going to serve as line cards for us. For the switch fabric, we're going to rely on PCI Express. So this is how it usually is shown, but this is how it actually looks like in hardware. So PCI Express is not a bus, it's actually a point-to-point -point interface between uh, devices and the CPUs. And uh, it's a switch network again. There's, uh, there are two ways to go about switching packets between uh, cards and the CPU. We can rely on memory transfers and read the uh, copy the DMA, the content of the memory from a device to the main memory. PCI Express also supports peer-to-peer -peer transfer. So device B can read directly from device A. This red hat. It doesn't need to go to the main memory. DMA again handle that. And these type of operations do not borrow CPU cycles. So we have quite a network going on in all of our computers, and we're going to rely that uh, rely on that for for our switching fabric. And then the CPU is used only for controlling this fabric, basically the scheduling transfers between devices or devices and memory. So this is just the uh, I think the aggregated bandwidth of current generations of PCI Express. Uh, the point of this slide is, I guess, to tell you that with an X8 link that usually these, like the, the cheapest parts come from, you can do uh, 8 gigabit per second per direction. That's around 60 gigabit per second for uh, each direction. And of course, PCI Express version 4 going to double that. So we have quite a high capacity fabric in, in, in PCI Express. It's up to us to leverage it with, 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 with the finer scheduling to take uh, advantage of this. So to sum up, the line cards, we're going to use Necronome cards to serve as line cards for us and use the existing PCI Express fabric as uh, what connects these line cards to each other. And for the controller, so this is, I'm going to be honest with you, our only contribution is here. Everything else, Netronome provides the <laughs> cards for you, Intel provides the PCI Express for you. It's up to you to uh, just add a DPDK program to control these cards and copy the, uh, the, the, the packets from ingress to egress. So this is a more like how it looks like in, from a logical point of view. So we can have multiple kinds of data path. We can have a P4 only data path, which is going to be the fastest because of those peer-to-peer um, -peer PCI express transfers. So if line card one is going to send the packet to line card two without uh, like any like DPDK application doing processing on that, we can make that happen. We can also augment P4 with DPDK. So do some processing at the card, then more processing at the CPU, and then more processing at another card. So you can see this as a, uh, like in P4.16 terms, if you're familiar with P4.16, three, um, three programmable devices. Two are uh, in a pipeline. Two are, in, uh, two are programmable using P4 and one using DPDK. And uh, we can also have P4 plus GPU in the same way as DPDK before. Um, so this is actually how our switch is implemented. So these whole these white boxes are basically DPDK threads, and the input buffer an input buffer switch is created. So each NIC card will instantiate some queues to all possible destinations. So in this case, we have three line cards, and each one will instantiate two queues. So this queue, any packet that goes to this queue, it would be, or it would be sent to one, and this queue would be sent to two. So uh, our DPDK application, the first thread of the pipeline, just holds these queues basically uh, creates a demand matrix for uh, current packets waiting to be sent. The second 
stage of the pipeline solves that problem. This is basically a bipartite matching problem between input ports, input uh, line cards, and output line cards. So we can solve a bipartite matching. And to, be, uh, to, to do it efficiently, because we can only have so many cards here, we can have up to five, assuming that each card is a PCI Express X8. So we can memorize the answers. We can just do a table lookup for solving a bipartite matching. So up to this point, we haven't transferred anything. The output of this point is which queues should be served. And then the last stage of the pipeline uh, sends, uh, like serves those queues as a specified by the previous thread. Because the reason we have multiple uh, threads here is just DPDK things, just uh, improve the performance. With one thread, you probably do not get a good throughput. So this is basically it. That's, that's what this switch does for you. Just uh, this idea is that to create this programmable schedule. And it fills into that gap that P4 leaves open. P4 has a lot of nice abstractions for data plane packet processing. But when it comes to scheduling, it doesn't offer any abstractions or any primitives. So this programmable scheduler here can be programmed using DPDK to implement more advanced uh, scheduling uh, schemes. Right now it's a FIFO, but it could be a priority queue or it could be a PIFO, it's up to the users. So again, like I said, think of this switch as a three-stage switch. Uh, you have a P4 programmable block first, a DPDK programmable block, and then another P4 programmable block. Uh, one problem that happens is that unlike uh, ASIC, uh, we cannot uh, pass metadata between these blocks if we just switch packets. So there has to be the, the, the other uh, contribution is just a way to uh, transfer metadata between the blocks. Just an example for you, the most simple metadata that we can, that, that each packet has associated with it is the output port. So assuming that the first programmable block uh, processes the packet and it figures out what the output port is. So it basically tells you this packet should be sent to this card and that port and this card. So card number one, port number two, for example. There has to be a way for this metadata to be transferred to this to the DPDK programs uh, so that it can schedule it in the send it to the right uh, card. Basically, the DPDK application only needs the card number. We've done that using the like having multiple queues, the whole input buffer suite. So the address of the queue corresponds to the destination port, destination card number. But the port number should be transferred to the third programmable block. So this, uh, this is basically the egress pipeline. The egress uh, has to know, it, has, it may have multiple ports, so it should know this packet, which port should be, uh, which port this packet should be forwarded to. One thing that we cannot, we don't want to do is to reprocess the packet here and figure out the port. We don't want to do that, it's not efficient. So we want to, uh, uh, transfer this metadata from the first block to the third block. So the way we implemented it is just by adding an additional header. So this metadata will be added, so it's actually going to look like this. So if I want to send the packet from NIC0 to port 2 of card 2, I'm going to put it on this queue this queue corresponds to uh, card two, so DPDK has that solved. And then I also add a header to the packet, and in that new header, I specify the port. So this third programmable device, uh, third, uh, basically the P4 code here, just looks at this number and do not reprocess the packet, and then send out the code. So in practice, this is how it looks like. Uh, this is just an algorithm. So on the left, you see 
what we actually want to do. We want to parse the packet, apply the ingress table on it, and choose the ingress board and send to it. So this is your P4 code. On the, that was left. On the right, uh, you have, uh, this is how this should be translated to our suite. So if ingress is physical, it means that we are in the first programmable device. So we basically apply the ingress tables and choose the ingress port. And then we have to make a decision. If this port is local to this NIC, if, if this packet happens to be forwarded to a port on the same NIC, then we just send it to ingress. Otherwise, we encapsulate it and send it to ingress. By encapsulation, I mean just add a header. We add that uh, the port number as a header and then just put it on the proper SRIOV virtual interface destined for the destination we have. Uh, and if the ingress is not physical, it's coming from a virtual interface, means that this packet is already processed, it's already passed the DPDK scheduling program, so we just decapsulate it and send it to the ingress pipeline. And in egress, it's a little bit simpler. So again, we, what we want to do is the part on the left, which we want to receive the packet, just uh, apply the egress tables, and then deparse it, send it actually out, serialize it. What we have to do in this suite is to uh, check whether the ingress is, uh, whether this is the first block or the third block, basically. The point is we apply the egress pipeline also in the first block, assuming that this is P414. So in P416, we can probably do it better, but I'm still assuming this is P414. So the egress pipeline of the P414 is also applied in the first program of the device. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will be just the parts. Meaning that this node means that we're in the third program of the device. Uh, so this is basically uh, how we should translate. If, if, if a user gives us a code for the switch, we should translate these code, these P4 code, to something for the card. And this is how, basically, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it compiler. It's a very, uh, maybe too much, but just maybe translation. So this is in practice how a switch would like, like uh, how a HIMO switch would look like. Uh, so we have a polling and scheduling DPDK application that should be there. This is actually providing the switching for us. And we also have to have a compiler to translate the user's code for the switch to code for line parts and also translate the rules. So um, if a rule is only going to be applied on line part one, it's just going to be smart. Don't, don't push it to all of the line parts. Just push it to the proper place. And then so uh, the, the, the DPDK or uh, NFE applications can be installed on top of these. So this is basically our vision for how this switch would work. And then, uh, so this is some preliminary result. This is just, mind you, what I explained is basically this P4 only data path. I assume that we don't want to do anything at the DPDK level other than scheduling. So these results are uh, from the same assumption. It's only the delay that a DPDK application uh, would add to, to this code, just the, the scheduling delay. Um, you, you can look at our paper. I have the citation at the last page. It's basically, um, I think it's a 8 by 8 switch and doing that. Uh, uh, so each interface would send this much traffic, and uh, this is how much delay added compared to. Uh, just one new part without the schedule. Um, I also have a demo for you today, which is uh, I wanted to make it interesting. So my demo is actually assuming that you want to implement something like 
this, the P4 plus PPDK, instead of P4 only. This is actually more interesting. Uh, this is what uh, this is what most of NFE applications require from us. They they have logic that is hard to uh, be implemented in P4, and DPDK just uh, gonna add some value on top of the P4 code. So the idea is to put all of the table operations on the line card and just keep things simple at DPDK. Do as much in the line card, just the single operation that you cannot do with P4, just do it as a DPDK application. So for that, I need to change the share the whole screen. So can you see the terminals? If someone can help. Uh, yes, we can, Ashkan. Okay. It's kind of, the font is pretty small, though. Okay. Um, this is I don't think, I think I cannot change it right now. Yeah, go ahead. But the idea is so, so let me go back to the, um, to this way. So this is only one line card. Uh, we have a moon gen traffic generator sending traffic at line rate. And then on this line card, packet are processed in a, like a P416 terminology with three programmable devices. The first programmable device uh, is, is the line card P4 compatible that is just a wire. It's a naive example. The second uh, programmable device is the DPDK code that is doing some monitoring function uh, per, per flow. So the assumption is that we cannot keep a larger state at any card. We want to keep the state at the DPDK application, per flow state. And the third programmable device is just the router. Just uh, So I'm going to show you the P4 code first. Um, so it might be too small. I'm just going to explain it. Um, basically, we for the parser, the only thing you need to change for the parser is to be able to parse uh, Mac in Mac encapsulation. That's part that we needed to send the metadata along with the packet. Here we implemented with Mac in Mac encapsulation. So another type of Ethernet header is defined if a type underscore DPDK. This is uh, our metadata, basically. And we have uh, for the ingress pipeline, we just check whether this packet is already encapsulated or not, whether uh, a metadata header exists or not. If it doesn't exist, then it would be a wire uh, to send it to a virtual interface. If the metadata does exist, it goes to the forward table. The forward table just do longest prefix matching. And we have rules installed on the card to send uh, each, uh, like, uh, inter each, each, each IP address on the proper interface. So, we stop it. And then should also show you the traffic generator code which sends traffic on two interfaces for the given duration, receives it on four, and also measures the delay. So I'm gonna install the code on the part now. Hopefully, it will work. Okay. 
and then we need to bind the um, the ports, the virtual interfaces to the DPDK application, which I think I've done already. Just to check, no, I haven't. Uh, so I think. So the ports are, so these are the virtual interfaces that we created. And also run the DPDK application. So this DPDK application um, is a little bit different from what we have um, here. It has uh, one receiver thread and one transmitter thread. So it doesn't have three. And there are some worker threads in between that do the monitoring for us. And also, they measure the delay. So um, so we have one transmitter, one receiver, and four workers. These workers are like packets from the same flow go to the same worker. They are so high speed. So if I send the traffic. Uh, so I'm going to send it for like 30 seconds uh, with a rate of 10G per interface. So on two ports, we are sending the traffic, and on four ports, we are receiving the traffic. The traffic is uh, UDP packets with random IP destinations. And they are uniformly random, so these receiver ports should receive uh, like 5 gigabits per second each. And at some point, we should see some statistics. So this is just the rate at which we send and receive the packet. So we're sending a little bit less than 10G and receiving a little bit less than 5G on each interface. The, the, the average delay is around 32 microseconds. This is end-to-end -end delay. And this one should also calculate uh, the delay for the PPDK only application. I'll just a way for you to judge um, which part is causing the delay. So, this is the delay only added by the PPDK. This is uh, expressed in CPU cycles. So, 24,000, uh, I think it's around 10 microseconds, a little bit less than 10 microseconds. So the average delay is, uh, I think it was uh, 30 something, 33 microseconds. The, the part of delay added by the DPDK is just around 10, I think. So it's, the point is it's comparable. Uh, it's not an order of magnitude. It doesn't make your card, make your force switch an order of magnitude off. It's just uh, maybe it's in the same order of magnitude. And finally, uh, just let me go back here. So the implications of this is that um, it's very much like P416. I'm going to confess that, but then we originally submitted this. It was before P416. Um, the part, the, 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 the things that we are working right now is implementing something like priority queue at the DPDK application, something you still cannot do with P4. And uh, so we already run that. We can find the results in the paper. There is also another effort to implement PI4. Uh, this was a work in CICOM 2016. It's a very interesting way to implement a scheduling algorithm. Uh, it's also work undergoing to implement 
programmable PI flows at this level. So they kind of showed that if you have a PI flow as your scheduling algorithm, you can pretty much implement any uh, scheduling algorithm. Uh, another thing that is suitable for this PPDK layer is uh, monitoring operations like what we did here, or again, uh, atomic operations that you cannot do with P4. Uh, again, Domino is uh, another paper in was in 16 or 17. So it introduces uh, another way of looking up, uh, looking at uh, packet forwarding in data. So all in all, uh, just to sum up, uh, uh, it's just uh, what this switch provides for you is programmability that is P4 and in addition to DPDK. It provides some modularity. You're in charge of choosing your own cards, how much packets they can process. Uh, the, you can get programmable scheduling with it. The, the um, throughput is somewhere in between. It's better than NetVM because you do, you're, we are doing some part of the packet processing using hardware. But it cannot, still, uh, it cannot match real ASIC, obviously. And uh, so it's just a compromise. I think it's very good for like academic projects uh, that, that give you more programmability than P4, but not at a, at a respectable truth. So with that, I want to thank you for attending and just if you have any questions. OK. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in the uh, in the uh, chat sign on the uh, in the chat bar, and I'll uh, relay them to Ashkan. Um, one quick, so if you do a new protocol, which parts of your design get affected? If, so if you're, you're doing a new protocol, I think so. The parser we try to implement the whole parser in in P4 as much as possible. So if you don't have variable field lengths and stuff like that, only the P4 code will be changed. And the way we see it, we, we would like to minimize how much parsing, uh, can I find this shape? We would like to minimize how much parsing DPDK does because that's very slow. That's why we use this kind of shenanigans to uh, uh, do everything at the card and minimize the DPDK workflow. Okay. And in terms of a, um, a, a switch feature like recirculating a packet or cloning a packet, where does that happen? Um, so <laughs> that, is, that is interesting. That is not something that we have covered. So it depends. Uh, if you want to recirculate, again, it depends on the ports that you want to recirculate. Uh, if it is local, then you can do that. And if it's up to the, the NIC also should also support it. Um, but in general, I think it should be implemented at the DPDK layer. So that's one more thing that the DPDK layer should support. And it doesn't right now. Okay. Um, any other questions for our speaker? Okay. Um, I'll uh, repeat an announcement we had last week. I'm really pleased to announce um, the 603 SDK is available for OpenNFP members. Um, it has some new features on timestamping that, um, that some of the uh, uh, users in our community asked for and also reduces host memory usage and matches large headers in a packet. And uh, the other important thing is we've done a fairly decent amount of testing with a range of applications from OpenNFP, uh, the P4 community website, and P4 apps in uh, published by third parties. And hopefully soon we'll be uh, testing the, the uh, hybrid modular switch as well. So if there are no more questions, uh, Ashkan, thank you. I'll hand it back to Carly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby.
Bhakti and Ashwan. Again, a copy of the presentation and archived replay will be made available shortly. Thank you all for attending.